Hey everybody and welcome to Hell is for Children. This show is on every Saturday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, which is 2100 hours Central European Time. My name is Geerte Franken and this show is all about the topic of protective mothers and their children. So what's a protective mother? A protective mother tries to protect child or children from their abusive father by many means necessary, which is an uphill battle in today's global corrupt family court system that thrives on paternal entitlement. And today's guest is child abuse survivor Brendan Byrne, who was forced into full custody of his abusive father together with his brother JP when they were only 10 and 12 years old. And through emotional and physical abuse, their father ensured that they were completely deprived from their mother. And 18 years later, they were reunited with their mother as adults. And Brendan is going to introduce his book, uh, Don't Hug Your Mother, which he wrote together with his brother. And it's also helpful for kids who are currently in uh, full custody by abusive fathers. And we had this show, uh, we started the show last week, but we had some audio issues, so we're redoing it this week. So, welcome, Brendan. Thanks, Geert. Thanks for having us. Um, I think the sound is a lot better this week, all right? So. Yes, a whole lot better. So, thanks for, for hanging in there with us and yeah, um, rejoining us this week. So. Absolutely. So, you wrote this wonderful book. I have it over here. Yeah. And I see behind you, too. Um, I did, yeah. It's a product and it's a memoir about uh, how you and your brother were taken from your mom and placed with your abusive father when you were about 10 and 12 years old, correct? That's correct, yeah. And it's, it's basically the book is about how our father turned us against our mothers and forced us into not seeing our mother for what lasted um, 18 years before we were adults, in which case we um, sought to find her again. Um, but uh, to, to probably the best part to start is really at the beginning or whatever like that. So um, it was around the late 80s or whatever. Um, my father started having an affair with a, um, a younger woman or whatever. So um, but she was, would have been 16 when he started having an affair with her. So um, he would have been 28. Um, um, he uh, himself and my mother subsequently separated. Um, and... There was a, the, the, the law was very strange in Ireland at the time. I mean, um, certainly women didn't have a lot of rights. Um, whatever rights they have now, they, they had even even worse rights then. Um, so uh, in around 1989, there used to was a there was a law here in Ireland, the Family House Act. It was, it was that um, used to uh, basically mean that the, the husband kind of owned the family home. Um, and it seemed to be, that changed in 1989, and it seemed to be just around that time as well when um, uh, they separated and my mother moved out of the house with myself and JP. My father stayed in the family home um, with his new mistress um, and our eldest brother as well, Seamus, who also stayed in the house. And he would have been 15 at the time. Um, we were, I was eight and JP was 10, so... Um, we were at the time. I was very happy with that because um, I wanted to stay with my mother. I didn't have a wonderful relationship with my father at the time, and I was a lot closer to my mother. Um, so obviously, I was quite pleased that I was going to live with her. I mean, obviously, it wasn't ideal. Your parents are separating or anything like that. But I was like, well, this actually hasn't worked out too bad for me, to be quite honest. Because so I spent a year or so living with her, and then to my <laughs> to my uh, surprise and horror. Um, I started hearing my my father and mother would regularly have arguments still at this stage where he'd be calling up, say, to collect us. And um, this, the argument seemed to stem around from what I heard. I kept hearing maintenance payments, which I know today are like payments that he was supposed to be making to my mother. And she was struggling to pay the rent in the house that we were in because, you know, for whatever reason, but, you know, I can, you can probably guess from basically from my point of view, what I heard was arguments about maintenance payments and arguments about my mother paying the rent. Um, so these arguments then moved on to him deciding that he uh, wanted us back to live with him again. Um, so he wanted to basically get out of the child support. Sense. Well, you know, 
I, I, I don't want to, you know, one of the things we did with the book was we stuck to exactly what we know as the facts. Um, and what you can do then is you can kind of devise from that what you will. Um, it, you know, uh, <laughs> absolutely. What you're saying sounds very likely, really, you know, let's put it that way. But um, what had ended up happening anyway, the arguments continued. Um, I was very much against living with him. Um, even prior to like while I still lived with my mother or whatever like that like we obviously had visits with him and the visits were like you know he sometimes he wouldn't be there a lot of the time he wouldn't be there and um, if he was he'd barely acknowledge me um you know so you know I remember even as a child like as a nine ten year old boy going this guy doesn't even why do I have to visit him because he doesn't want me to be here and I don't want to be here so why are we doing this like what's the point you know sort of way so um, was he abusive at this point as well? Not really, no. It was just more, um, at this point, it was more just, it was as if, you know, it was barely kind of existed, you know, in its life. I was just sort of, I was somewhere down, low down the list of his priorities, put it that way. And um, that's how I felt anyway, you know. So um, he wasn't, no, but he wasn't abusive to me. Now, our older brother, Seamus, though, I remember like seeing things where he'd be, punching him or whatever and he'd be asking Seamus to hit him back and stuff like this which was kind of weird um, well that's also a form of uh, you know if, if you see your sibling getting hurt then yeah. that's also child abuse for you yeah well you know? I mean it sent a message to me I was like Jesus don't mess with this guy because uh, he's going to start doing that to me then you know so you know but up to that point he hadn't as I say up to that point I actually think my mother kind of protected me a lot from him um, you know, and, and when they'd have arguments or something, if I was there witnessing them, like my mother would try and get me out of the situation or whatever. Or if she couldn't fail in that, because he'd sometimes want us to be there for the arguments for whatever reason. Um, you know, after he'd leave the house then or whatever, and she'd sort of comfort me and sort of tell me not to worry about it, that it's an adult thing and, you know, yada, yada, yada. So up to that point, I kind of, yeah, I had sort of avoided that kind of, um, uh, kind of physical abuse that would come uh, later on. Um, he instilled the fear in you. Yeah, yeah. I, so the fear was there, and even you know, at that point, even like if, you know, he'd shout at me and stuff like that. You know, if if I wasn't sort of doing things that he wanted, and even that would scare the scare the hell out of you as a you know as a young boy. This kind of older, you know, he's your father. He's a supposed to be a kind of um, a, you know, a person in charge of you or whatever like that. So. Um, He's supposed to be your role model. He's supposed you know? to be your role model as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thankfully, I didn't really buy into that too much. But um, <laughs> um, he, uh, yeah, so at that point, you know, I was very against, as I said, moving back in with him. Um, JP had changed throughout the year that we lived with her mother, which was very strange to me at the time. Looking back at it, and even him looking back at it, and we've obviously talked about it, like, up until that point as well, when we moved out, he was kind of also, you know, kind of just an, an afterthought or whatever to my father. Maybe a little bit more involved with my father's plans because he was a little bit older, whatever like that. You know, he could bring he'd bring him sometimes to the park and stuff like that, where he'd say, "You you're too young" or whatever like that. And he'd bring JP and James, and they'd kick a rugby ball around or whatever like that. So, uh, you know, to some extent, he was a little bit closer, but he was still very much. I would have thought very much closer to our mother. And when we moved in, myself, JP, and my, my mother, we got a lot, you know, on like a house on fire. Seamus used to come and visit us. He used to stay in our house nearly more times, I think, than he was supposed to be permanently in our father's house, you know. Um, and by all accounts, you know, I was pretty happy at that time, um, you know, as things were going. But JP, uh, somewhere along the way, after a few months or whatever like that, just started acting very strange, you know, like it seemed strange to me, like, just really small things, you know, at, at first, like where he'd be like, start giving out about what my mother had cooked us for dinner. And I'd be like, oh, what's wrong with it? Like, and you never had a problem with it before. Uh, like, you know, she, she might make a curry, say, and she'd use a jar, which, you know, I regularly do myself now as well. Um, and he'd start as an 11 year old giving it going, what are you doing using a jar? You should be using proper ingredients and stuff like that. That's a lazy way of doing things. And it was like, you know, looking back now, clearly he, what, this isn't a thing an 11 year old child says without hearing it. You know, and that's when I look back and that's one of the things that stands out because that never made sense to me as a child. So I was like, what? But things, then he started like saying things to me where he was like, oh, you know, if we move back with our father or whatever like that, would it be better or whatever? Wouldn't it be better kind of thing? 
and I used to and I, I used to argue with JP very rarely, but anytime we did argue or whatever like that, generally uh, he'd actually win the arguments. And um, maybe it was because he was a little bit older or whatever. I don't know, but he generally he just he he usually was able to make sense. Where I'd sort of say, okay, well, fair enough. You but this was one where I was like, no, hang on a second. How on earth could it be any better living up there? I am like he's not a nice guy. Living here with a mother is great. We have, you know, we have her. She gets us whatever we want, whatever. She looks after us and, you know, we enjoy our time here and all that. And his argument back used to just be like, it, it just would be better if we moved with that. It just would be, you know. And I, and I was like, that's not like him to even argue like that, to just, go, it just would be to not make sense. He always, and any other argument, made a point of why we would or whatever. So obviously I didn't see it at the time, but at the time it seems clear looking back that, um, our father had been uh, talking to him anyway and trying to persuade him that it was a good idea to move back with him. Um, and then try to get to you through him. Exactly, and then try to get, but because he actually didn't really try on me or whatever like that, um, I don't know, but it just pushed me even further away from him. And, you know, the fact that Gar was, uh, just, just the fact that everything was happening like this or whatever like that. Um, and I could see a change, say, in JP or whatever like that. And I, I knew it was down to my father, you know, that sort of way. Uh, so I kind of, I was kind of annoyed with him about that as well, you know. So there was a lot, lot to like about him at the time. So anyway, there was an argument then at the front door where he was demanding that we choose um, wh who we wanted to live with, him or our mother, you know. And it was when he, he came to pick us up where we were going to stay in his house that night, you know. So I was pretty scared that like I was you know I know I'm going to get in the car with him now after I answer this question so if I give him the answer he doesn't want you know what's he going to do you know so well, that's a great question too absolutely you know, and, and, but with, with what parent do you want to live that's yeah and, and, and I mean it's not even here how's it going you know what parents you want to live it's like right let's ask them then you know and my mother was saying no we don't don't involve them don't you don't have they're too young he said no it's their lives it's their lives let's ask them and staring at us here use who do you want to live with then right who do you want to live with and JP breaks down crying and reluctantly as well, breaks down crying and reluctantly walks over to my father. My father's smiling like, you know, yeah, see, I won this round kind of thing. Now, I didn't walk over to my mother, but I didn't walk over to him. And I just stood there and said, I'm just standing on my ground. And I was like nine or ten years of age or something. But I was like, oh, there's no way I'm walking over to that, him because I, I don't want to live with him. Like, I, it's not, not even like... A question of I might want to or just you know I don't know it's 50 50 here I was like I really really don't want to live with this guy I want to stay with my man that's it like there's, there's no gray area here um so he just looked at me and he you know with disgust or whatever and then he said to my mother that um you know the reason why I wasn't the only reason why I wasn't because I was too young to understand and that she uh, molly coddled me which is basically she 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 used to you know treat me as a mother treats their boy like hugs so and you're a mama's boy or something you yeah, exactly. make fun of that's, that's what he made it out he was you're a mama's boy you're you know she model molly calls you you're you're um you're weak because of it you know what i mean you're you're not a real man almost you know what I, mean? I wasn't a real man i was nine years old <laughs> right and, but, uh, you know, at the time, like, you know, it does have an effect on you. And you're like, but I still didn't really care, like, what he thought of me because of the fact that I was so kind of disliked. But I was like, and he can think what he likes. I don't care. I want to live with my mom. I don't care if he thinks of this, that, and the other, like, you know. So, uh, unfortunately, he decided that, that that was a winner for him, I think. Um, and, you know, I don't know what goes on in the background, obviously, as it being a child or whatever like that. But um, before I know it, I find that... Lo and behold, I'm back living with him and his um, mistress, who, uh, you know, wasn't exactly, she was, when we first met her, she was very nice, um, and then met her a few more times, and then she wasn't very nice anymore, she was quite the opposite of nice, you know, and um, she had us doing everything in the house from, you know, washing to, to ironing to hoovering to cleaning, cleaning their bedroom, making their bed, you know, uh, you know, pick it up after her, picking her knickers and stuff up and, you know, putting them in the wash, absolutely everything. Like, you know, they just, they just get dressed at night time and leave their clothes in the heap on the floor. And me and JP have to clean up after them. So basically, essentially, like, you know, they had now gotten themselves two uh, slaves for the house. Two little slaves. Yeah, little slaves. that's what it's and, like. now they didn't, and now they didn't have to kind of pay that child maintenance to my mother anymore, you know. 
So, you know, it seemed like a win-win for them. Um, and obviously it was a very much a loss for us because uh, suddenly we're going from, you know, <laughs> if anything, our mother just picked up after us all the time or whatever like that, to now suddenly um, having to pick up after these two people who were horrible to us and who not only like you picking up, like what it used to really annoy me was that it wasn't even that I didn't get gratitude, but you'd be, I'd be told that I did everything the wrong way, you know? So I do the Hoover and did you do this Hoover? And you did a shit job of it. You're a fucking useless, lazy bastard, blah, blah, blah. And this is at 10, 11 years of age. And you're like, and I used to I try so hard then to do it right, to try and avoid getting this. And this is mainly from my, uh, Natalie, which was my father's mistress or whatever, who ended up, they ended up getting married as well. Um, but um, yeah, so it was just, it was just horrible living there. And obviously it was just like, you know, we wanted to move back with our mother. But then on top of that, then I'm sort of thinking, well, maybe I will move back with our mother. And we're still mo- seeing our mother at the first couple of months or whatever like that on visits. But very, very quickly into it, he's like, our father was said to us, look, you go see your mother. Uh, you know, it started off at the start. You go, you go visit your mother now, okay? Go down to her. Um, he'd, Natalie would brush her hair to the sides and do it differently to the way her mother had done it. And he, they, they bought a couple of new, and not even a lot now, just a few <laughs> new outfits for us. Um, about three or four new outfits. And we always had to wear those outfits and say, this is the way that Natalie dresses us um, now or whatever like that. And uh, to an extent, I didn't really understand all of that. And I kind of didn't mind doing it because I was like, look, whatever keeps everyone, you know. And I, I, I don't know if it had any effect on my mother at the time. I mean, I'm sure it did, did look back, but certainly at the time, I didn't feel like I was harming her in any way saying that. And um, I didn't feel like, I, I, I didn't know why my father was asking me to do it. And I, I just was like, look, it's easier to just do it. Um, but then it escalated. And the first escalation was that he would say, okay, because she'd always try and give us some, when we'd visit her, she'd always try and give us something, maybe like a present or some money or whatever, and particularly around birthday times or Christmas times or whatever like that. And there was one particular time, and I think it was close to Christmas, um, it would have been quite close to Christmas actually, because it was a, it was a comic book she wanted to give us, um, it was a Beano annual, um, and they only come up, out around Christmas, so it was definitely coming up. So she took it out of her bag, I remember we were in a restaurant, she took it out of her bag and she handed it to um, JP, and she said, there you go, there's a present for you. And JP, acting on her father's orders, turned around and he was like, um, no, no, you're grand, they don't want it, or whatever. So my mom turned around to me and she said to him, Brendan will have it then. And I just looked at the floor and just shook my head. I was just like, I know I'm not supposed to take it, so no. And obviously I really wanted the comic book as well. I was, you know, this was, this, like my mother knew what I liked and that was what I liked, you know, and that's what I would have, I would have loved to have that and gone home and or gone home to her house, preferably, but, you know, and sat and read that and, you know, whatever. But um, I was under orders to say no, so I said no. And I was, you know, I was able to do that to an extent, but at this point, and again, I mean, it's not that I was even thinking, I remember feeling bad for my mother at the time, but I also felt annoyed at the fact that I wanted this book and I couldn't take it. I was like, why the fuck is he asking us to do it? Why is he getting us, or not asking, ordering us to do this? So then it escalated. Anyway, he obviously decided that he had succeeded in doing that. And he was delighted when we come home and we'd sit, tell him the stories and we'd be rewarded with lemonade and crisps if we you know, didn't take the present or whatever like that. So then it escalated then to him saying that um, if you go down to see your mother this time now, he said, um, yeah, I want you to do She goes to give you a hug. You can duck out of the hug and say you don't want to hug her, that you just don't hug her back, don't hug your mother at all. And thus the title of the book. And um, so... I was even, at a 10-year-old now at this stage, I wasn't able to do that. Um, I just couldn't do it. I was like, no. I was like, you know, everything was kind of shit at the time of my life and everything. And I liked getting a hug from my mother. You know what I mean? Like, uh, It's awful. Hug. It's awful to hear your father's teaching you not to hug your mother, not to not take just, any not pressure. Just teaching, though, not just teaching. Teaching is one thing. Ordering and forcing. Or- you know, uh, so, like, I mean, with this hug thing, I couldn't do it. So I went down myself, JP and Seamus went down to visit our mother. She went in to give me a hug and I gave her a hug back and everything else. And everything was grand. 
and then on the walk back up, Seamus started saying to me, he was like, here, listen, you're, you're such a mammy's boy or whatever like that, you know, uh, dad told us you're not supposed to hug her or whatever like that, and now you have or whatever. And I was like, oh, you know, whatever, Seamus or whatever, he just older brother giving me a hard time, you know. Now, he was talking, obviously, Seamus is, it, it would, would be the last person to kind of say that he was with 15 and he was under orders to make sure that we didn't hug our mother and stuff like this. So he was only... So it, it was going down from yeah. your oldest brother to uh, to JP and then to yeah, you. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Oh. yeah the, 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 the order of uh, authority kind of thing, you know. Yeah. And, and that was the general feeling in the house as well, you know what I mean? Like, she, she, Seamus was told, and I remember hearing our father saying to Seamus, like, you're my right-hand guy, like, you're, they're too young to understand, but you can help me you know, do what's right for you and what's right for all of us, you know, is basically, you know, your mother is no use for you, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, this subsequently led, in my opinion, to Seamus has some, a lot of psychiatric problems now. And I, I think it all stems from this. In my of opinion. course. I mean, he didn't uh, get the chance to develop his own personality. Absolutely, he was yeah. a handler of his younger brothers, right? Yeah, yeah, well, that. And he was also being turned against our mother as well. But at a later age of 15, where we were actually, weirdly enough or whatever, I don't know. But I, I, I kind of, it's as if we were almost young enough to adjust to it. In a, in, a, in a strange kind of way. I mean, we never fully adjusted to it, but in a kind of, I'm, I don't know, I just tried to make sense of the fact that he has psychiatric problems on myself and JP. I think the fact that myself and JP were close in age, and we kind of had each other also helped us. But anyway, it's, a, it's probably a different story. <laughs> but um, so the, the, what happened anyway from then on from that was myself and uh, JP went to visit our mother. Um, and I decided that since Seamus wasn't there or whatever like that, I, I, I could hug my mother as well because I decided that JP probably wouldn't uh, give out. I knew he wouldn't say to me why. Or, you know, and we actually discussed and he was sort of saying, I don't know why our father is asking us not to hug our mother. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to him either. So I hugged our mom uh, and then when we went, he didn't. Though. He said <laughs> he, he decided to go with my father's orders. And then when we walked back up to the house or whatever, he was like, oh, you're not supposed to hug mom. And I was like, oh, yeah, but it's a stupid rule. It makes no sense. And he was like, yeah, you're right, Grant, or whatever. So we went back, and, of course, it was always an inquest as soon as we went back. Okay, what did she say? What did she do? Did she go to hug you? Did you hug her back? And I went, no, I didn't. No. Uh, did she try and offer presents? No, no, no. Like that. This it sort of seemed to rack JP with guilt then. He watched me lying to my father and say, you know, no, I didn't hug her. And I had. Um, so I thought that was it, that was Grant's. And then it would, within about an hour then, I hear my name being called, shouted at, down the east stairs. JP's after telling me you owe your mother. What the fuck are you like? What are you, you know, you're a useless little fuck. She molly coddled you. She's this, what kind of a person are you? How could you do that to me? How could you do that to, to Natalie, who's looking after you now? You're hurting her and everything. You're just trying to tell me. Um, so it's all about guilt and yeah, there's yeah, lies. Yeah. You're you're forced to lie. You're forced to feel guilty about hugging your mother. I mean, it's outrageous. Yeah. So it was. Uh, yeah, it was. It was outrageous. Like, and I mean, just those episodes alone are enough to kind of, in my mind, to just sort of say, what a fucking asshole that guy is. But um, it, it goes on because then he just it, it, he he manages to. Because of this and because of the, the I mean, he, he hit me after that or whatever as well. And that was like, okay, if I hug my mother, I'm going home to a beating. I'm like, I don't really want that. Like, So the next time I went to meet my mother, she went in to hug me. And I just looked at the ground. I, I stared, actually. I, me, I remember it so vividly. Um, I had a pair of blue jeans, I remember. And there was kind of a patch, a white patch on the front. And I just focused on the patch. And I just stared at the patch and my mother went to hug me and I just went, ducked out and ducked around and stared at the patch. And my mother was like, what's wrong? And I was just like, no, it's grand. I just, I, I don't want to hug you. I can't hug you. And why can't you hug me? Uh, I, I just, I don't want to talk about it. I just don't. And she was, I could hear the hurt in her voice, you know, and that made me feel extremely guilty as well. Um, well, she did you of, did you consider saying to her like I'm not allowed to? Uh, yeah, I did. I did say to her I'm not allowed to. You know, I did say that. 
And I think that's what kind of got her kind of to kind of go, well, okay, well, look, you know, and she, she, would, my mother was kind of the type of person who wouldn't say a bad thing about anybody, including her father, even to this day, to an extent now, she, to an extent, but she still won't, like, she, we couldn't sit around now. I'd, sometimes I'd love to sit around with her and, and, and say, listen, our father was an asshole, let's talk for three hours about it. She wouldn't want to do that. She doesn't want to, she just, it, one rule she used to always say to me when I was younger, there's some good in everybody, I remember, and it's the one rule that she used to tell me that I don't uh, agree with anymore because I just don't think there's any good in, in my father, like, you know. So, yeah, so, I mean, she seemed to get it together anyway, and we, we went, and we went to a restaurant, whatever, and we had cake and whatever. Um, and, and we talked or whatever, but I could tell at the time she was hurt, but she seemed to get it together. So we went back to our house after the visit, and obviously the inquest, did you hug your mother? And I was able to honestly say, no, I didn't. Um, and it was like, fair play to you. Yeah, you're a great kid now, you are. Fair play to you. And lemonade and crisps and what have you. And I remember just thinking, you know, because you don't really understand it at that age, you know, but all I could understand was, on one sense, if I if I do what this man tells me to do, things aren't too bad. If I don't do what this man tells me to do, things are really fucking shit. So it's kind of like, you know, what can you do, you know? What I did do was I started acting out, and I don't remember even doing it kind of consciously or whatever like that, but I started acting out and doing all sorts of crazy things, particularly in school. Um, and I, for that entire year, like I went from being quite de- pretty good in school and kind of under the radar kind of, kind of student, like, you know, just quiet or whatever, to suddenly being a complete lunatic in school, and uh, which I was nearly suspended a few times. I tried to set the, the, the school on fire. Um, <laughs> so you were acting out, you had to yeah, act it out yeah. somewhere. It was kind of like, I think I was kind of like sort of saying, look, someone's going to notice this and say, listen, this guy was grand when he was his mother, and now he's not anymore, and put two and two together, you know. So it was but, kind of like an SOS. Yeah, but it didn't really happen. There was, I remember there was one thing, I mean, I don't even have this one in the book, um, because <laughs> when, when myself and JP wrote the book, it was actually originally 190,000 words, so we had to try and cut it down into a readable amount, where it's now 100,000 words. So there's so many episodes we actually had to leave out of it, <laughs> you know, to make it actually a readable book for people. All right, part two. <laughs> yeah, we exactly. We might have to. But um, there was, yeah, because there was another episode, I remember, I, I left the school. I convinced a friend of mine who also said he wasn't happy at home. Now, this is, we're 10 years old or whatever like that. And I'm talking to a friend, and, I, and he was, I think he was in trouble for some reason at home or whatever like that. Probably legitimately, I don't know. So I said, here, listen, I have this idea in my head for ages now gonna run away um from home and kind of go live we could i was like so naive like i remember thinking it was actually realistic like there was a massive tree i knew in an area and i was like if we we could probably like build some sort of a tree house up there and stuff and live in it and all like you know just naive and i remember i was like going all i need is like one pound which is like the equivalent to one euro um and if i have like there's sweets for 10 cents and they could last me like for a day, and then, you know, that could keep me going for 10 days. And so I, I thought I'd convinced this guy to run away from home with me or whatever. And I went with him towards his house, but it was also the opposite way to my house and kind of up. And I was like, okay, now we have to turn right to go up to this tree. And he turned around and he was like, oh, God, I'm not messing, man. I'm not running away. Why the fuck would I run away, like, from home? Like, and I was like, gosh, because I wasn't, like, you know, I don't want to do it on my own. And he was like, oh, dude, I'm going home. Like, you know, things aren't that bad. I'm, and I was like, oh, shit, they are for me. But um, I thought about it, and I was like, well, if I go, I did think about it, seriously considered it. And I was like, what will happen is I'll be found. Someone will say, good God, your your father will be so worried about you. Bring me back to my father. And I had it in my head, I remember. I said, they'll bring me back to my father. And my father will stand at the door and say, oh, my God, thanks for getting my son back. You're so great. We were so worried or whatever. And then whoever it was that brought me back would go and the door would close and then he'd tear fucking strips out of me for fucking putting him under the spotlight for fucking going against what he, et cetera, et cetera. So in the end, I was too scared to run away from home because not because I was scared of what would happen to me when I ran away from home. I was too scared of being caught, being brought back to him and having to face the consequences of what he would do to me for running away from home. So, um, so I didn't in the end. So I went home and just 
try to endure it like um and then it was after that then i kind of sort of said oh, like gave up altogether then at that stage and uh, yeah there has to come a point where you have to almost you're forced to accept the situation that you're in even though you're extremely unhappy and you want to get away but what can you do right yeah. um, well i mean after that i started doing i found i remember i found, I found these tablets spies at all tablets that um were actually anti or indigestion tablets but i didn't know what they were and I just thought there's some sort of medication. So I started eating loads of them and spraying pertinatalies, perfume stuff in my mouth and all, trying to drink perfume and stuff like that, trying to see what I just pass out and die. I just wanted to because it was just that bad. Um, and I ended up then trying to slip my wrists and stuff in the kitchen and trying to clean up after it was blood dripping. I was trying to clean up the kitchen after it at like 11 years of age because um, I was like, again, even worried at that point that... Um, I would still, I'd make a mess of the kitchen while I'm trying to do this. So that, that was your worry. That was my worry. While was, you're splashing was, your Yeah. And I was like, look at my wrists are bleeding and stuff. And I'm like, oh, why am I fucking dead already? And what I was doing, I was actually slitting across. And <laughs> I, I know now, not that I had ever planned to ever do, but you know, you, you're supposed to obviously go a different way. And thankfully I didn't know at the time. So I was unsuccessful. Um, and then, because I was unsuccessful, I thought that this was some sort of miracle, and that God had wanted me to stay alive for some reason. So I turned to to, to last refuge when you're really fucked. I was like, "Right, God, help me out here." Um, and every day I'd come home from school, and at this stage, um, JP was in secondary school, so he was in school later, um, and. But my father and Natalie worked, so I'd come home, and after doing all the housework. Um, cleaning all the rooms and their bedroom and the bathroom and all that kind of jazz um, then I would spend a good hour on my knees uh, praying to God openly talking to God to ask him for help and do something for me and if and I was, I'd make bargains with him I'd say if you do something for me I'll stop trying to kill myself you know that seems like a deal God you know what I mean well, help me out here um, so uh, then, I don't know, things just, you kind of, as you said, it just comes to a point where you just sort of accept it. I'm like, oh, well, I've tried everything and nothing's worked. By this stage then, what had happened with our mom uh, throughout that kind of period was we went from the visits to don't hug her to suddenly uh, we had this huge big uproar where we went to the cinema with her and we went for tea and cake afterwards and we were in immense trouble um absolutely the worst trouble probably jp has ever been in in his life with her father for staying out with her mother to have tea and cake after the cinema yeah and i mean this was intense this was intense um we were sent down to our mother sort of as punishment which we didn't see it as punishment to stay with her in a, in a neighboring county where her relatives lived um, and we went down, and it was the best weekend because I was with my mother for the whole weekend. We were supposed to stay on a Sunday night, and JP kept, the whole weekend, he kept on trying to find pay phones to ring our father and say that he was sorry and all this sort of shit. And I was just like, JP, cut the fuck on like this. Don't be ringing him. Don't, don't go, we're, just enjoy what we have here, you know? And on the Sunday, he rang our father. Our father said, do you want me to come down and pick you up? And, our, and, and JP, I remember I was standing beside JP. I was like, oh, I, I, I said, hey, he shouldn't have rang. I was like, don't ring him. Tonight's going to be great. We're sitting in. We had videos uh, that we were going to watch with our, our mom and our auntie and sweets. And, you know, and it was just going to be great. We we're going to sleep the night there. And I was like, this is going to be a great day. And JP rings. And, of course, he's like, do you want me to come down and pick you up? And JP's like, eh, no, my grand. What do you mean, no? Do you want us to come down and pick you up? And JP, of course, the guilt. Uh, okay. So with that, you know, he hangs up the phone. He's got to look at me with a sad face. He's like, sorry, like, a, they're coming to pick us up. And I was like, you fucking asshole. <laughs> I was so angry with him at the time because I was like, you just ruined what's going to be an amazing night. And now we have to go back with these guys. So, so that's what happened. They picked us up. And I didn't know at the time. I was really disappointed with everything. So I spent the last two hours... Um, while we waited on them to drive to pick us up, moping kind of, and almost almost fighting with my mom because I was like, can you not ring him back and say, no, you're not coming up to pick me up or whatever. And she, she was like, oh, it just doesn't work like that. And I was just like, oh, you know, what's the story? 
So I didn't, I was kind of just moping with her. I was talking to my auntie more at this stage for those two hours. And I didn't realize at the time that that was the last time I'd actually see her now for 18 years. Because I can imagine Ed, when I'm listening to you that there must have been a, f a feeling of frustration that your mother couldn't help you and yeah. that, that you probably felt angry at her for yeah. not being able to rescue you from that situation, right? In, in my mind, you know, there was only one person in the world that I thought could help me here, and that was my mother. And if she wasn't helping me, I was like, well, why not? Like, you know, you know, you told me when we were younger, you'd protect me, and you'd, you know what I mean? You told me not to worry about these things when there was arguments and all that. And now it's all gone up, you know, shit creek, and I'm stuck living with him, and you're not doing anything about it. Well, what's that about? Like, And, of course, she probably doing everything behind the scenes to try and, you know, stop this happening. And you know, she was more, I, I remember when we moved out of her, the, her house, I mean, she was broken, like, you know what I mean, like um, crying her eyes out and everything else. But um, what could she have done, right? I mean, well, that's... looking back, what could she have done? I mean, look, I look back now and I say she had no money. She was completely dependent on him before the separation. She was a housewife, you know, uh, which was in Ireland in the 80s. It was promoted to be a housewife, you know. Um, uh, women, as I said earlier, they didn't have many rights. Like so much so, I mean, JP was only telling me the other day that in the 80s, um, obviously, Ireland and England are beside each other. If a husband moved over to England from Ireland, even if the wife stayed in Ireland, she became domiciled in England. Thus was the kind of rights of a woman in Ireland <laughs> in the 80s. Like, you know, it's just, it just boggles the mind. Like, um, So anyway, as a housewife or whatever, she was completely dependent, as I say. Um, when they separated, he hired his own private solicitors um, with the money that he had and she was forced to get what is known in Ireland or at the time was known in Ireland as um, free legal aid which is um, as it, it's better than obviously what happens in the states at the moment where I think you don't get any attorney but um, at least you're you were given some sort of attorney but it's it's a free it's a state aid it's um, let's just say if you're gonna be trying to be a successful solicitor you're probably not going to go work for the legal aid people like uh, you know if you're trying to if you if you're very ambitious if that makes sense you so know, the moms like, all get the shitty attorneys basically exactly i mean it's it's you know if it's like anything you get for what you pay for and if you're paying nothing for it i mean i'm sure this guy i mean i remember him uh, mcnulty her solicitor i'm sure he probably tried his best or whatever but he obviously wasn't very good and and you know things have happened since then that that, that have led me to just be kind of because he's, he's still around now and i just i'm like what was he doing like how did he agree how did he how did he allow that happen now that's you know i don't know it's it's hard for me to know as i say what went on behind the scenes so it's hard for me to make a judgment call what went on but you can make your own mind up based on what has happened. I mean, you have a man goes and has an affair with a 16-year-old. He's 28, has an affair with a 16-year-old and moves her into the house. And the mother and the kids are out of the family house. Like, you know, none of that makes sense already. You know, sort of, it's just, you know, but um, that's how it happened. So as I say, at the time, I didn't really understand any of that or why that happened. But, um, yeah, our mother tried to call us a few times after that trip, um, and at first, like we'd have phone calls, and we'd know that there, you could hear the other phone upstairs say clicking, you know, and there was kind of an, an extra echo where your call was being listened to, you know, and then um, that that obviously didn't they didn't like that anymore. So uh, one of the days, um, JP had actually been on the phone to her mother. And she started crying and he was crying or whatever. And our father came in, having listened to the call, we're pretty sure because he heard the whole echo and all that, came in. Who's that on the phone? It was our mother. You don't need to be talking to her. What she wants or whatever. Uh, she said she misses us. She sounds sad. That's what JP said to her, to her father. And her father, she's not sad. She doesn't love you. Does she? Oh, <laughs> he always remembers, he says, crocodile tears. That's what they are. Like she's faking tears or whatever like that. She doesn't love you. She doesn't care for you. She's abandoned you. 
And that's what kept on being told to us then because we couldn't see her and we didn't see her. I mean, I remember Natalie even turning around. She's like, if you, if, if you were my uh, biological children, so to speak, whatever, and this, I was in that position, I'd be camped outside that door, banging on the door before it. And I was like going, yeah, why isn't my mother doing that? Whatever like that? You know, looking back, you're like, well, you can't really actually do that because the police will come and pull you away. Probably. <laughs> you know, um, but uh, yeah, so it was just constant then from then on in. But I mean, our, our, our father and Natalie then were completely in control. Um, our mother didn't get a look in. Um, in order to survive, I would say, in under these this regime that I was now under, it was the best thing to do was to, after a while, was to kind of pretend like I agreed that my mother had abandoned me and I agreed that she didn't love me. That's but awful. At the start, I didn't go along with it and I was like, why aren't you whatever? So um, very, it was all a very short period of time as well. Like literally we'd moved in within a couple of months. We were all connect, all contact was gone from her. And my father and Natalie then got married over in Florida, Puerto Rico, somewhere because they couldn't be married in Ireland because they were separated. Divorce wasn't in Ireland at the time. So they got some foreign marriage. Um, and when they came back, basically when they were away or whatever, I got a postcard from them. I was staying in, in an uncle's house. I got a postcard from them. And it was signed. It was, it was very oddly written. It was written. Um, Natalie had wrote the, the kind of postcard part or on holidays or whatever we're sitting by the sun or whatever and then we, I was like oh, I don't give a shit like why am I getting a postcard in the first place it was really not like them to send me a postcard to, as if they thought of me like you know sort of way. Um, but then my, it's noticed that my father had signed it off where Natalie obviously hadn't signed it off for whatever reason and my father had signed uh, dad I'll t- tell you about it when we get home dad mum xxx or something like that and i remember looking at it and i was like 11 i was like mum who the fuck is mum i was like going it's not ma'am <laughs> who was my mother who we called ma'am who the fuck is mum so they get back from holidays and they had some presents and stuff for us i was kind of like eh, maybe they're not so bad like you know what i mean we've got the presents and we we were, I remember we were out in the, uh, on our green and stuff, like, you know, we were kind of happy with what they brought us back. It seemed like, now it was all just tacky crap, like, to be honest with you, but just getting anything from them was kind of like, hey, you know, maybe they did think about it, and they sent me a postcard and all that. And in a couple of days then, um, our father said to us, you know, listen, you know, Natalie's really good to you. She's very fond of you and everything. Things just start calling her mum, as in your mother. And I was like, I can't do that. Like, I just can't, you know, it's not even... I'm trying to be bad, like, or I'm like, or or go against it or rebel. I just can't fit. It just physically can't say, call her mum. She's Natalie. Yeah. That's all it's I can call. It's completely unnatural. Absolutely, yeah. it's completely unnatural. So we didn't. That's you know, we kind of okay, and then we didn't, and then it went from that to why the fuck aren't just calling her mum? Yeah, and we were like, well, it's kind of awkward. Well, look, you're upsetting her every time you don't. She really wants you to call her mum. And I got the distinct impression she didn't give a flying fuck about what we called her. You know what I mean? This seemed to be all his kind of thing. This, so, this guilt trip constantly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the guilt eventually worked on JP, and he started calling her mum. I just couldn't. Even if, even if I wanted to, though, even if the guilt trip had it forced me into it, I couldn't. So when my father was around like to avoid calling her mum, I knew I couldn't call her Natalie because he'd go, why the fuck are you call her Natalie? So I'd just say, like, I'd just go up to her and tap her on the shoulder. We'd be in the same room, tap her on the shoulder, and then I'd ask her a question or whatever. Or else I'd just go, eh, like that for ages. until Try she, to avoid it, yeah. Try anything to avoid it because I couldn't, I just couldn't do it. It wasn't even that I was trying to rebel against him. I just couldn't do it. So one day then I was, uh, he, he asked me to ask, and it's this all, looking back on this, this whole um, everything seemed so planned by my father in that even this episode seems planned. I remember my father said to me in the kitchen, he was like, go and ask um, Natalie something or other, but she's upstairs. And she, I could hear her with the hairdryer upstairs. So I stood at the bottom of the stairs and my father was in the kitchen and I felt he was out of my earshot that I could just kind of shout up. So she, and Natalie, um, dad wants to know, blah, blah, blah. 
and everything like that. And uh, when I shouted at Natalie first, the hairdryer was gone, she couldn't hear me, so I had to shout it a bit louder. And Natalie, Natalie, and then next of all, I see him storming out into the hall. He grabs me, he drags me into the dining room, twists my arm around, up against the wall. What the fuck? I told you, you have to call her mom. And that's when I went, look, I just can't, I just can't. He goes, you fucking will. You will call her mom. And he, in my face, blah, 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 gave me a thump across, you know, and I was just like, okay. Brian, obviously, um, went back into the hallway and he stood there watching big, angry, red face on him. So, and I went, mom. And she answered in a real fake kind of yes yes and i went dad wants to know blah 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 oh, okay there's the thing and then he just turned around yeah it's not fucking easier and i was just like yeah well not really but so from that point on then i called her mom as well it was still hard at that time but i was like i'm not getting another belt off him you know so i didn't um there was other weird things that happened like um Years before that, we had found out that Santa Claus hadn't existed, you know, and it was, we had a few Christmases where Santa Claus didn't exist, where we were aware that, this is when my mom and dad were still together, um, and we were aware that the presents had come, it was actually Seamus that showed us bikes that we had gotten from, we thought were from Santa, and he showed us them before Christmas, we were like, <laughs> we were like, because I believed in Santa up until then, JP was on the fence, and I was like, Fuck, okay, there is no, but at the time I turned around and I was like, actually, quite grateful to my father because I was like, well, that actually means that my father got these from me in a way. I was like, okay, maybe he's not such a good guy. And this is when I was five or six, or not such a bad guy. This is when I was five or six. He's after getting us these bikes. And himself and my mother, I remember, brought us to the park and taught me to ride the bike. And I was like, you know, this is one of the things where I was kind of, just where I remembered it so well. And then the next Christmas, I was like, thanks, you know, Dad, you're going to get me a present and all. I realized Santa isn't going to run and it was grand, it was grand. Just went on for a couple of years. So now we're 11 or something. I'm 11 and JP is 13. Or 10 and 12 maybe actually at this. Yeah, it was, we're still 10 and 12. I'm trying to think of the year. It was 1991, so I'm 10. And JP is 12. And um, next of all, uh, our, our father's like, um, are you going to write your letter to Santa? And I was like, what the fuck is he on about? Like, you know, Santa was gone ages ago. And he was like, uh, yeah, now you have to write your, your letter to Santa. Myself and Natalie are very excited about this whole Santa thing. Natalie's going to bring you to see Santa. And our mother used to always bring us to see Santa. Even after we didn't believe, she used to bring us just for the crack, you know, even though we knew and we would say. Like, um, so Natalie was going to bring us to see Santa. And we were supposed to pretend that we thought Santa existed. And I was like, this is just insane. But it's getting weirder and weirder. Yeah, yeah. I kind of went along with it. Like, I mean, obviously it made no sense to me as a kid. And it made no sense to me up until when I was really writing the book and I look back at, back at it and I'm like, a few months after this, obviously, what I didn't know at the time, but there's a separation case coming up. So in the summer, the following summer, there's meant to be this separation case, in which case he wanted myself and uh, JP to kind of, be there to separate case and be and to be seen to be living a great life for himself and Natalie and do you know what I mean so all of this probably fed into that and Natalie brought them to see Santa and Santa brought them this and all that because it, I just couldn't make any more sense of it so this is when I was writing the book I was like well that's obviously because I was like why else would he do all this crazy shit and what I rem the reason why I remember it so well as well is because I was like obviously I was like I don't believe in Santa. I've known for years that Santa doesn't exist. And then he bought this home computer, um, an Amiga 500 home computer or whatever like that, and he put it in. There was a spare room, and he put it in the spare room and locked the door, right? So I, I'm, as I said before, I come home from school, and nobody else is in the house for a few hours because JP is in secondary school, and they're at work or whatever like that. Um, and I'm like, suddenly there's a, there's a room with the door locked. And I'm like, what's in the room? So I look in the keyhole and through the keyhole, I can see this computer all set up on a desk. And I'm like, and I was like, all oh, right, that must be for Christmas. I was laughing because I was like, Santa's going to fucking bring us that computer. That's great. And um, so I was talking to a friend of mine who lived next door. And I was like, oh, so there's this computer now or whatever. We're obviously getting it for Christmas. Or whatever. It's locked in the room or whatever. And between the two of us, we realized that, you know, you can actually just get keys. Um, all keys of doors work. You know, so he had a, a big box of keys in his house. So we tried a few of these keys. So we did. So we got in. Um, and it was all set up. Joystick, the game's ready to play or whatever like that. So uh, after school then for a while, myself and a 
couple of my neighbors, I'd have half the road in and we'd all be playing this computer. <laughs> and it is for this last for a couple of months and then i'd even said to jp even though i was really afraid because jp used to kind of always get found out about things when she these inquisitions he used to be guilted in i got him involved as well and as he was playing as well we were all delighted and we were playing away <laughs> um, and uh, then um christmas came and that morning or whatever the, <laughs> the computer was unveiled and we were like oh no, wow santa's deadly if you play the santa that's great and we were playing a game, I always remember there was a James Bond game we were playing, you know, and myself and JP were really fucking good at it. And our father was like trying to play it then. He was like a small child. He was like, oh, my go again, because he was shit at it. And he was like, I've had, he, in his mind, he was like, I've had this for the last two months. They're only starting playing it and they're better than me. How the hell did that work? Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so Christmas came and went anyway. And after Christmas, so we started, yeah, pretty much two or three days after Christmas. It was like, okay, so he's got that computer room right now. It's getting locked back in that room, even though it was supposed to be a present for us or everything like that. And he was using it for, I, I think, for work stuff and everything else. Like, it was, it was down as a present for us. And we were, playing, we were quite happy because we were playing games on that stuff. But it was locked back in this room. And we were told, okay, when you are good, when you do, as, a, as a reward, you'll be able to go in for half an hour and play or an hour or whatever. But, I, of course, I still had the key. So I was like, yeah, that's grand. And they used to, to frequent the pub quite a lot, like, so they'd head off like off on, on Saturday or Sunday, like they could head off at twelve o'clock in the day and not come back till that night, you know. So um I just opened the door and go in and play the computer and bring everyone in and everything else and it was great. But um Natalie used to always she she was always looking for things to kind of give out about if it wasn't that the household chores were done or whatever. She was always searching my room and I had the key hidden in my room. So she found the key. Um so once she found the key um, they, they had a, a quick inquisition with, with JP and it was discovered that yeah we, we had the key and we knew about the computer we never believed in Santa or whatever and my father's reaction to that and that's what makes me remember the whole episode is because his reaction to that was just so angry and full of vitriol because he'd obviously put a lot of planning into this for his to whole work um, and I remember and I was I just because at this stage I was kind of but all the place I said back to him, like I was like, I never wanted to believe in Santa. I told you I didn't believe in Santa, but you wouldn't fucking listen. But he took off his belt and he knocked the living shit out of me at that time. Um, so much so that I used to he 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 had enrolled or he had put us in a rugby club, like, and the following week, like I still had kind of bruises all over me where he made me he used to have to go into the changing room obviously to get changed for rugby or he made me change in the car and he was like because if the people see that or whatever you'll be put in the home you know and i was like oh jesus i might try and get people to see this because i want to be put in the home because i think it would be much better than living here like um but um but i didn't in the end you know but that was it like so uh, after that, that shows you Shows your desperation. If you rather live in a, a home or foster care or whatever, yeah, then yeah, well, anything yeah. seemed better. Anything seemed better than there. Like, I mean, absolutely. And I mean, they constantly. That was a thing. They constantly, particularly Natalie, she'd be like, "You think you have a bad hair? You could have it so much worse." Like, and I remember I'd be like, "Oh, I don't know. I think it would be much better." How can it be worse? Yeah, How can it be worse kind of thing. Like, but she was always trying to reinforce that. And you know, I think that was part of kind of. The, the whole job like you know if we if they say it enough times you'll start believing it but i never truly believed that um so you know yeah so at that point so within the space of that there a year and a couple of months we went from living with our mom quite happily to suddenly living with our father and his mistress and calling her mum and doing all the all everything like i mean everything in the house for them um, ironing her like she was a nurse and you'd have to iron her nurse's uniform on her slip that she had underneath it and the whole lot like you know and she'd come running like she'd come to this, like a regular monday morning where the fuck is my slip why haven't why is my slip ironed and shit like this you'd be like oh Just shit right. panic running around trying to find it. it was all our fault you know i'm gonna be late for work because you don't have my fucking gear ironed you little shit useless lazy bastard you know and it was like awful well, yeah you're, you're 11 and this is your responsibility like you know 10 even you know and it was um but the, so during, that, let me ask you a question during all this time did you ever consider writing your mom a letter no at this time i mean i didn't know what my mom's address was now at this point point. Um, my mom also started to uh travel and where she went to the middle east where i think she had reached the i need to find god's thing so she went to jerusalem and all these places 
and she would send postcards from these places um, saying that she was well. And so you got the postcards? Because my daughter's not getting any mail from me. <laughs> well, yeah, no, well, we got the postcards, but the postcards, we were under strict instructions when the postcards came to put them on the table. In a, all the posts we had to put, you know, categorized into his and hers, and, and the postcards were to be there as well. And he, you know, he was going to keep all the postcards or whatever. Um, but we did get them, you know, and I used to read them, and he would say, you know, look, postcard, look, she's in, you know, Jerusalem or wherever. Like she abandoned. Like she doesn't care about you. She yeah, care about you. she's off traveling around on holidays. Like, right? <laughs> she doesn't give a shit about you because she abandoned you. And I'd be like looking, kind of going, and you know, she'd say, "My mom would be like, I love you and I miss you and everything." And I'd be like, "Well, why are you saying that if you're off in fucking Jerusalem? And maybe he's right." Like, so one of the postcards came in. I remember, and uh, I said, "I had enough of this," so I tore it up and I threw it in the bin. And he found out about that. And I was expecting to be in trouble because obviously it did exactly as you were told. And we were told to put the postcards in the place on the table for filing. And uh, when he found out about it, though, he was absolutely delighted because he's seen yeah, this. Yeah, he wants you to be ha- angry, of course. Yeah. Said, why did you throw that? He said, why did you, why did you tear it up and throw it in? And I said, because I'm fucking sick uh-huh. of reading about her holidays and after her abandoning me. And he was like, you know what? You're a great kid now. And I was... It's his favorite for like a good two or three days then. Even Natalie wasn't allowed to really give out to me for those days. Like, you know what I mean? It was, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was interesting. So I knew then from then on to, to do that, you know, because it kept happy. But I never really bought into it. That was the thing, you know, that sort of way. So, well, that's interesting. Like somewhere in all of this, you were able to keep connected to your heart and to your true self yeah, in all well, of it. He was such an asshole, though. That was the thing. If he had been a lot nicer or even a bit nicer, I think it would have worked because I would have been more, <laughs> just he's a nice guy. But I was like going, you know, yeah. if anyone else was telling me this, I'd believe it and it all add up. But at the end of the day, I was always suspicious of him because he was such a fucking asshole. So that's why it never worked because I was just like, and I had to kind of hide so many other things from him because I knew, like, if he believes something was black and you said, no, I think it's gray, you know, it would be a fierce argument. And you just, the best thing to do is to just fucking agree with him because otherwise he, you know, he cut you off or something, you know? So I knew with everything, I was always kind of um, humoring him. You know what I mean? Like if, if he said, hey, you know, isn't your man there wearing a stupid jacket you know and i go yeah that's a stupid jacket you know even if i thought it was the best jacket i've ever seen because it was easier to do that so i was always doing that so uh, you know this was just another kind of thing where i was like okay well, i'll just go along with this one as well and in the end I, you're just playing a game all day yeah, long yeah, you're just absolutely. putting up a facade to just keep the terror and the horror at exactly. bay to just survive and just get and i'm like obviously aware that at this stage, Seamus, basically, when Seamus was a month show, shy sorry, of 18, he was kicked out by my father and Natalie because he kept on, well, I mean, there could be a million reasons why he was kicked out or whatever, but basically, in my memories, himself and Natalie kept on arguing. Now, like when he was, I think she was 22 or 23 when she moved in and he was 15, so there's a close age difference there even, you know what I mean? Like, and then I didn't think he was even asked to call her mom as well. Like, and he's like, what the fuck? This woman who's seven years older than me, like. It's bizarre. Yeah, uh, even, she, she, she's not biologically <laughs> able to be my mother, let alone fucking anything else. Like, and he was quite close to her mother as well. So, um, it, also it, bizarre, right? I mean, they, they could have been boyfriend, girlfriend more than. You know, <laughs> and that was the thing. And, you know, like, you know, her teenagers think at 15 or whatever like that. I mean, perhaps things like that were going through his head. I mean, it must have been very fucking confusing. Like, um, she was, you know, she was the kind of, she was like, it would have been deemed to be quite kind of glamorous. You know, she was always makeup on and fucking all this sort of shit, you know. So, I mean, she'd, sp- she'd spend an hour and a half or something before to go out putting on makeup and dressing herself up. I'm probably a lot of women do that or whatever. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but what I'm saying is she was someone who really took after her appearance and she was... Mm-hmm. Um, seven years older than him so yeah i mean i would imagine there probably was weird thoughts when she was eight that would confuse and conflict him like you know but because he had moved out or because he'd been kicked out at 17 he ended up because kicked out then he had uh, breakdowns and stuff uh, he moved back in for a bit um and then he was gone again and um, i think he left himself this time i'm not really too sure but um basically I kind of was like, well, you know, once I hit, 
kind of 18 I can get the hell out of here as well so I just have to keep up this facade until then and because Seamus had had his psychological problem, problems I was like and I just have to try and not have psychological problems as well um, so that was that was kind of where I was at at about 13, 14 you know I was like just, just live until, until so you were then. just counting down kind of yeah, the days yeah now, the thing was it's again, you know, interesting, as I say, the way my father seemed to be meticulously planning everything was because once I kind of got to about 15, 16, now, that, that's, that's only a couple of years in our lifetime now that we're older or whatever like that. But hey, when, you're, when you're 10 until that age, basically, that was, a, that was a long time. Like That felt like a lifetime to me, you know, even looking back at it or whatever like that. That, that was a long time. But w- once I hit about 15 or whatever like that, he started being a bit nicer to me, you know, a bit more. Um, he'd, he'd, he'd spend even a little bit of time talking to me or whatever like that. He was kind of a charismatic kind of guy in a way. I mean, he got away with so much shit, with, uh, you know, that he, he had to have some sort of charisma about him or whatever like that. And I remember kind of thinking, well, ah, maybe he's all right now. Maybe he's not the worst or whatever like that. And every year that I got a bit older towards 18, the nicer he was to me. Um, and by the time I was 18, I was like, oh, you know what? He's not as bad as I kind of used to think. And maybe, like, I didn't know anything about kind of, I didn't know that this was kind of a thing that happened to other mothers or other families. And I was like, maybe something my mother did to him that he's not telling us, that he's keeping it from us for our own good. Because he seems kind of all right now. And maybe, maybe something was wrong with her <laughs> wrong with her. exactly yeah. and that's why he did it and maybe like he was just so frustrated because i wasn't getting the point when i was younger that he started you know the, the physical abuse whatever was just frustration and that was you know partly my fault for not copping on that you know because he was trying to keep this secret that my mother had secretly done all these bad things to him that he wasn't telling me like i mean i'm just making up excuses myself for him at 18 Plus the fact so you're trying to make your, your your brain and your mind is trying to make sense of it because it's so yeah, it's that as well exactly. Now in my own situation as well was um, when I was eighteen, then I had my own son as well, and I was very dependent then on having somewhere to live, obviously, so that I could somewhere where I could bring my own son as well. So you got to be a father really young at a really yeah. young age. Yeah, wow. at eighteen. Yeah, so. Um, what it meant was, you know, if I had it, if if I if I didn't have a son, you'd move in anywhere or whatever like that. But when you have a baby, I'm like, I couldn't even you say you go to college. I couldn't go to student digs or something like that where they're having parties every night. You know, I had to either find my own place, um, which is property is very expensive in Dublin and Ireland, um, to rent and to buy. And it pretty much always has been, but it's um, at the time it was anyway. So. I was 18 and I was kind of going, trying to go to college and stuff like this. So I was working part-time. Um, so I was like, oh, look, if I just, it made sense for me as well as anything to kind of just humor this guy and get on with him because then I got to stay in the house and I could bring my son up to that house and everything else and everyone was happy. Um, so I stayed with him a couple more years. And JP stayed a couple more years, but then he moved down. And when he moved out, I think he kind of saw a lie. He started to get his sort of that independent thoughts. Um, because even at 19, 20, when I was still living with them, you're still um, you're still hearing their skewed perspective on everything. You know, sort of way. You're still not. It's pro- probably surprising to the viewers and to me too that you didn't try to get out Absolutely. at as soon as yeah. you turned 18. Yeah. So explain that to us. Yeah, well, I mean, as I say, there's the. the, the yeah, right. there's the dependency thing, first of all. Um, there's also, as I say, him gradually being nicer as I moved closer to 18. Um, as well what, do you as that, think was that, what do you think that was about? I think he realized when we got to 18, we'd sort of turn around and say, say oh, hang on, what the fuck was this all about? Or whatever like that. Whereas if he was kind of nice to us and had us on side, so to speak, or whatever like that, we were obviously less likely to to delve too far into it with him anyway, you know, the sort of way. Because when we did, what well, ended up happening like a couple of years after that then when we did ask questions about her man, he'd be like, um, you know, oh no, no, she's grand, don't worry about her or whatever. Like 
oh, you know, you know, and then he'd start then saying, trying to remember things. He'd say to us, like, do you remember how I rescued us from when you were down in Wexford with her on that weekend that just hated being there? And I rang and I said, you want to come down and pick us up? And you were like delighted. You, oh, no, no, not even he rang. He said, and, and you rang me begging to bring us home. And me and JP were like, that's not what fucking happened. Like, but he was obviously building up so that he could sort of say it. And even when he said it to us at the time, like we didn't turn around and go, what the fuck are you on about? Like, you know, we were kind of like, because eh, yeah, we're supposed to be mates with this guy kind of at the moment, but this is kind of weird. It took for myself and JP to really talk to each other then, um, where we kind of went, listen, there's a lot of stuff. He's trying to remember the past in a different way. And we still didn't even at this stage realize why or what, you know, what the whole thing was, even in our early 20s. We were just like, you know, just, you know, that that's, that's, that's wrong. And why is he doing that? You know, even if he had us, if he hadn't made up the past, if he hadn't tried to change our memories of the past or whatever like that, I said, why is he doing that? Now, as it turned out, there was a divorce. Divorce came into Ireland after a while or whatever, and there was a divorce case between my mother and my father was coming up at that, that stage when we were in our early 20s. And uh, so well, they became, weren't divorced yet? Oh, you know, they couldn't they, be they divorced. They separated for years. They could have got, got kind of divorced probably by about the year 2000. Or, yeah, I, I can't remember the exact years. Um, but yeah, they weren't. They probably could have got divorced a little bit sooner than that. But anyway, it's neither here nor there. Um, so basically, um, yeah, when the divorce, when, when we found out the divorce case was happening, you know, he, he called us in and a family meeting, so to speak. So, you know, I want just to testify against your mother, you know, say that she was a bad mother and all this sort of stuff. Um, and that's when it became clear to us why he was trying to make us remember things, because he wanted us to go in court and say, um, we were down with her this one weekend and we hated being with her so much that we rang him to come down and collect us. That would have been ideal for him. So when we turned around, we were like, actually, I don't really believe this. You know, so much where some of the court case did happen. Like we went to the court with him and his barrister even was like, saying, you know, the amount of money you're offering to settle this basically um, is paltry or whatever and shouldn't happen or whatever like that and he kept on saying oh, the kids are gonna they're here they're gonna testify against her believe me i don't need to give her any more money or whatever like that they're here to testify and myself and jp we still didn't really talk about it to each other at the time but we were both really 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 uneasy with this whole thing it's it's awful, awful. Awful. sorry yeah my microphone's is okay. that okay yeah no worries it's okay um, so, yeah, so at, at that point or whatever like that. Um, so you were asked to testify against your mom we at this point? Yeah, at that point we were asked to testify against her. And that was basically the breaking point. We didn't have to testify, thankfully. And I I remember thinking if I go up on the, 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 in the dock or whatever it's called and place my hand on the Bible, again, you know, I'm not going to be able to to do this i'm not gonna be able to tell his lies and then he's gonna be really fucking angry with me again you know and i was just like this is a shit situation so it turned out we didn't have to and i was like oh well that's great we didn't have to um, and my father was delighted because he had won this victory where he didn't have to give our mother any money um so i remember just looking at him just after it and i was just like it just all clicked then it just all made sense i was just like this guy's a fucking asshole He's just, he's just so mean, and uh, you know, I was just like, this is, this guy's just wrong, or whatever. And he was trying to get us to stay around for celebratory drinks and all. And, and <laughs> oh, myself and JP left separately, though. You know, I went back to my girlfriend at the time, his house, and he went to his, I think. Um, and we were both just, you know. I remember just feeling, I was just like, I just felt sick. Just, I was just like, I have been part of that. And I was like, I wish I could reverse now a couple of days and go and, and say to him, here, listen, you know, the divorce case coming up, I'm, I'm going to, if I get asked to stand up, I'm going to say you're a fucking asshole. That's what I'm going to fucking say. I'm going to say that this happened. I'm going to tell them exactly the truth. And I hope that they, you know what I mean? Like, but you can't turn back the time, unfortunately. So that's the way it goes. But you yeah. feel really violated because yeah. you realize I felt you, so yeah. used. Yeah. So used. I mean, I was just like, he just used us. 
so that he wouldn't have and to for years in a row to build up to that point <laughs> exactly. i mean it's yeah. just so planned you know yeah. i mean what Top kind nine, of absolutely. monster is doing that yeah. to their own child like you know what i mean yeah. like how, how can you do that like no. and that 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 kind of brings us on to a point as you say how can you do that is the type of person that does that um that's what's so hard for for people to understand for normal people to understand that's what's so hard for us to understand when we were kids growing up, even up until that point, because it was only at that point that I realized that what my mom had said years ago about there's some good in some people, it was at that point that I realized, hang on, there's no good in this guy. And I was like, and he has no conscious whatsoever. Like he is so unscrupulous that he will do anything to anyone to get his way. His kids is like, even today or whatever, I mean, and Natalie says his wife or whatever like that. If something happens or whatever like that, he will fuck her over to get his way. I know that for a fact. He will do anything to anybody just to get what he wants, to win his game, because he thinks everything's a game. And that's what I realized then. Go, well, a person can't think like that. A person thinks everything's a game. And that's what I realized then. Go, well, a person can't think like that. A person can't. You know, and, and you always have doubts. And it's like, no matter how bad that person is, they can't be. But I think if you put it in a simple terms of like, it's, you see the memes that go around on Facebook and Twitter, and I'm guilty of posting them on myself. And you go, you have one like, um, d- doing this to your kid or whatever, stopping one parent from seeing the kid is, is, is child abuse and you should be ashamed and all this. And we post them up in the whole, and some one of them I remember I was just posting, I was like, what is the fucking point of this post? They don't care if it's child abuse that they're committing. No, they don't they care. They don't care. They don't feel ashamed. They don't get shamed. They don't get guilty. They don't get anything. They just keep on living life happy as fucking, how do they sleep at night? I don't know, but they do. So they're a different breed of people. There are a different breed, breed of people. Yeah. And, and, and it, when you scan their brain with an MRI, it shows that the, the, the center of empathy that we have in our brain yeah. that lights up when we feel for someone yeah. else, they don't have that. They don't have, that, they have exactly. any electrical activity in there. Yeah. Well, there you go. I mean, I didn't know that, but that, you know, pretty much pins it down. And I, I just think that's an important point when you're dealing with these people is to realize that because when you're dealing with... You can't with reach people, them. That's the point. Exactly. The thing. You can't you communicate can't them. with them. <laughs> people say to me, they say, well, what, what, what the book or whatever like that, you know, this is going to shame your father or whatever like that. And he's going to be so angry. I mean, he's not going to give a fuck. The only thing he's going to worry about is can the book reopen the divorce case with her man? And it, will her man end up, will he end up losing money over it? Yeah, it's a bit of money. Oh. Yeah, it's about money, money and power, money and power. Yeah. Like he couldn't give a shit. If, if he walks out and his next door neighbor turns around and goes, you're a child abusive prick, he'll be like, I couldn't give a fuck. And he'll get into his BMW or his Jeep and he'll fucking yeah. drive. He doesn't yeah. care. And that is the, the thing. So I just think like from a point of view of other mothers or whatever who are dealing with these people, you'll occasionally think, oh, well, he'll give me a bit of leeway here because he'll have his conscious or whatever. You always have to remember that he has no conscious. Uh, no scruples whatsoever. Um, so, you know, he's, he's liable to do anything to, to your kid or to you or, you know, just to get his way, to get what he wants. Um, you know, and obviously it can be a woman as well, I suppose, as well. It's that narcissistic thing or whatever. It doesn't want just to men or whatever. So I suppose it's the other way. So where you are at now, um, do you have any contact with him still or? Well, when we, when we, published the book we decided to bring up a copy for himself and (laughs) um, it was it was yeah well it was it was interesting because we were um, you know we hadn't had any contact with him for a while he he had ended contact in the end like I I don't want to go through the whole thing because we'd be here all night basically but in the end what ended up happening was once we started kicking against the whole hang on what's the story the way you treated us and our mother was bad and everything else. He was like, right, fuck this, I'm done with this. So he sent a text message to me saying, he, he actually, he had a phone call with uh, JP where JP, he said um, something about Natalie or whatever like that. And he goes, your mom, you mean? And JP said, no, Natalie. And he goes, right, fuck you, good luck, and hung up the phone. 
and immediately pretty much goes off and sent me a text message. She said, I just said goodbye to JP and now I want to say goodbye. So I guess I'm going to say goodbye to you as well. Would I like to talk, but that's not going to happen. I always remember it, like I'm reading it. I go, you know what? Like he's just, you know, broken the father child relationship through text message. Through a text, <laughs> through a text, message, text message. In one sentence. In one sentence. In one text message, not even leading into two text messages. Um, oh my God. And uh, but the thing about it was was because and I didn't really realize it so much at the time. I realized I just went. I remember feeling kind of shitty that my father had ended my relationship with a text message. But I felt really free. Though at the other side, I was like, yeah. "I'm really fucking free of this prick. I don't have to deal with his manipulation and bullshit anymore." And I realized that he has ended it. I haven't ended it because I knew I could never end it. Because as we say, to them, it's a game. Mm -hmm. And if I say, we're not going to talk anymore, he's going to just keep fucking firing shit at me until he ends on his turn. So he had ended it, which meant I actually didn't have to talk to him yet. Now, there's other bits and pieces to the story or whatever like that, um, and none less so than a half-brother that we have, which is Natalie and her father's um, son, who I did have a relationship up until it was four or whatever, and it was around that time when the text message happened that um, shortly after that was his birthday and obviously I wanted to get birthday presents to him but I didn't want to talk to my father or Natalie which I think is understandable so I realised that they wouldn't be there on a Sunday because they were mad for um, show jumping Just, uh, they went down every weekend to the, the show jumping um, so I knew that they wouldn't be there on the Sunday and his birthday was on the Monday so I went down on the Sunday and they uh, put the presents very carefully in behind a kind of a side gate or whatever like that. And I left them there um, and I says, right, Grant, he'll get the presents anyway. I won't be here to give them to him, but he'll get them. And that's important. He'll know his brothers are still thinking from him. Um, JP was in New York at the time, so we got presents on behalf of both of us as well. So he, and a card from both of us, so he'd know. You know his brothers are still thinking of him. Um, so a day or two after that then, um, I got a knock on the door and it was my father and Natalie return on the present still wrapped and everything else. He said, it basically said to me, you want a relationship with him? You got to talk to us, you know, he, like he's their possession, you know? So, um, you know, effectively where we haven't seen him now for, for eight years. Yeah. History repeats itself. History repeats itself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, our older brother for five years, when he got kicked out, whatever for five years, he, we weren't allowed to open the door to him and all this kind of shit. He was alienated from, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, our father just keeps on, and keeps getting away with it. So that's why we were like, we're going to publish this book, and we're going to at least put it out there. Yeah, this is what, this is what you do. You, exactly. you, you publish the book, people. you publish the book, you put it on social media, you come on Hells for Children, and you expose it for what, it, what the fraud that he is. Exactly, absolutely. And for other people to kind of see like that's what i really want the book to 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 spread its wings far and wide because not just for helping other mothers and stuff which has been fantastically from the feedback i'm getting has really helped people people are coming back like i'm overwhelmed by some of the messages i'm getting that people are like oh, i'm seeing the mind of the person who i'm dealing with with my kid and stuff like that so it's already surpassed its expectations on, 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 on that level and hopefully it will continue to help people on that level. But as well as that, what I wanted to do, I want people who aren't in, involved in the, the kind of this world that we are all kind of in, all those Facebook groups and everything that we're all on, I want the people who aren't in them to see what actually happens because that's when it'll actually change. That's when the people will actually yeah. go, what the fuck is this actually happening at the moment? I mean what's horrible and i see it all the time or whatever is like yes, you and i know what it's like because we're in it like. and we want the people around the children exactly. that are in this to understand the teachers the the people at church exactly. friends so they can see the signals and get in there get and in rescue there. There kids. very yeah. wrong here i mean um like i hope you won't mind me saying this but it's the truth of the matter is the person who lives 10 doors up the street from you say who you don't really know right Probably, if she knows your story or whatever, probably thinks oh, she's probably something wrong with her. There's probably something. That's why. Oh, yeah, she, yeah. People she, are very judgmental. Exactly. And people just 
And you know what? If, if I just think there's something wrong with her and that's why she doesn't see her kid, then I don't have to do anything about it and I can go live in my fucking happy life. Right. right. Now, if, if people read the book or whatever like that and they sort of say, oh, shit, that shit happens. And you see what kids are going through and what kids are to, to try and stop it and everything else. Then you're turning around and you're saying, OK, well, maybe she wasn't crazy. Maybe my mother wasn't crazy. Mm-hmm. Maybe that well, woman, so that's maybe that's that one. Woman, yeah, maybe that woman in the street isn't crazy, and maybe her kid really needs her, and maybe her kid is going through yep. what me and JP were going through. Yeah, and it's like that's what we want because it's people rampant. It is it's rampant. It's rampant. It's 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 Absolutely. an epidemic. You know, it's, it's. I mean, it's it's just destroying relationships. It's destroying people. Like it's just trying. Like you know, obviously my sympathies are, are absolutely with the mothers, but I, I'm trying to take it from the ch- child's angle. And I'm like, my message is like, you know, that, that this is destroying kids' lives. And it's like, if myself and JP weren't, as I say, of a similar age, I don't know if we'd, because we leaned on each other to an extent, I don't know if we'd be, because then I look at my eldest brother, Seamus, and, and look, he's happy. And he was up with me here today in the house and the whole lot. And he's, He's grand and everything else, but he's psychic. He's, he, he can never live a normal life, you know. He can never get a proper job, so to speak. He's, you know, he's got too many psychiatric problems, like, um, you know, and, you know, my, my father and Natalie will claim that's nothing to do with them, um, and that's that, that wasn't what they did that caused well, They him. don't have any conscience, so they, they don't, don't have, have any They can't say anything like that anyway. Yeah, well, I mean, I actually think that uh, certainly Natalie at some point had a conscience, whether it's eroded away or whatever like that. Um, but she certainly did, and that's why I sometimes kind of hope that she might even read the book and kind of go, well, hang on, why am I doing this to sh- to, to, to the youngest uh, or, or half or um, Julian? Because uh, that she might turn around and kind of say, well, look, let's let's have the rest of his childhood happy. Let's f- sort this out. But I don't know, you know, th- th- you, sometimes you... Sometimes you... <laughs> it's good to keep your hopes. Yeah, you keep your hopes, don't you? And you're just like, well, yeah, some chance probably, but anyway. Um, so you, you've been... I, I know that when I came across your story, I was extremely happy that you wrote the book, you and your brother, and I want yeah. to express my gratitude to both of you for doing that because I can have a hundred shows and explain what it's like from the mother's end. Yes. But we really need to hear what it's like for the children and there's very little um I know that there's a little there's, out there because you are the first generation really to come out yeah, of this uh, this nonsense. Yeah. Uh, although of course it's been going on for centuries but to this degree where the mother is completely pushed out um yeah. that is the the epidemic that we're in yeah. um it's it's a new thing in that sense so i know you um you shared with me some some links um and I, what i'll do here is i'll share my screen here for the audience to see because i know that there's going to be um other kids who are still stuck in this um, listening to this show and they might be helped um, with these types of links which these are uh, people that dealt with uh, deprivation of the non-abusive parents and um, unfortunately they call it parental alienation which is a term that the mothers are trying to get rid of because this is what's used against us in court when Mm. we um, um, you yeah, know, I know, I know the, the, the kind of whole parental alienation syndrome and stuff. It's kind of it's a weird one because obviously, <laughs> if if I, basically yeah, they will accuse you of anything that they possibly can, I think in court. Um, but this is a particularly easy easier one for them to try and hit you with, um, in that they don't. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to seem to be any proof for you, is there? You know. Well, what I wanted to show here is that when there are other adults um, that have gone through what you have gone through, then Mm -hmm. this is one of the links that they can visit, right? 
and um, this guy, and I've, I mean, you, you sent me this, I've seen this guy talk about, um, he was alienated from, you know, from his, father, to, yeah. from his father, if we're going to use the term alienation, I'd like to keep stick with the term deprived, and, yeah, but it, yeah. doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, this, we know what we're talking about anyway. We yeah. know what we're talking about. He was deprived from his father, and he ended up uh, putting a whole bunch of videos out there on, on how to deal with it, and I watched some of them, I thought it was really good, and I... Yeah, I, I, I thought they were good. Seeing, yeah, I love seeing this. I love him sharing that healing journey. You yeah. know, that's and, what what's so important. And what I noticed about his was that it was a different kind of um, deprivation, so to speak. In that, um, his mother seemed to be quite loving to him. You know, the sort of way who who had kind of. Told, brainwashed him uh, that his father was a bad person on the whole lot. So it was kind of like child abuse with a hug, you know, the sort of way, like, um, which is a different kind of thing. So it's just because one of the things I always say to, to some of the um, mothers who message me and stuff is just like every situation is different, you know, and they're such sensitive kind of things. Like, so I'm always worried <laughs> or ever like that. Um, that. Yeah, there's there's also uh, uh, parents. Let's let's talk about the the abusive mm. fathers that will bribe the children, you know, with trips to Disneyland, yeah, absolutely, and clothes, yeah, yeah. And toys, and yeah. um, so they try to play the good guy, and then exactly. they'll say that your mom is crazy, and your yeah, mom's while crazy. You're, <laughs> and, well, you're you know. queuing up for some ride in Disneyland or something like that, and you might be like, well, this guy's a great guy, or you know, so absolutely, and that's the thing is. Um, that, that's kind of a message to get across. It's like each case is different. Well, the people are the quite adult, it's, it's the adult psychology against yeah. the very formidable uh, child's yeah, it's, it's, child's brain. So what I want to you know kind of put out there is for all the children who are watching right now. Let's say you are 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, or even younger, or even older, and you're stuck in this. I think the message to take away from your story is to stay really close to your heart and to yeah. your feelings and to your gut instinct. Like when you hear something that's not quite right, it probably isn't uh, quite right. Yes, right? yeah, no, definitely. And then, um, as I said, I think there was always a part of me, there definitely was always a part of me that didn't quite believe or whatever like that. And there was times during the earlier years as well where I was tempted to ring like these kind of child helplines or whatever, child and, and out of fear I didn't or whatever like that but I look back now I wish I kind of had of done that um, well let's talk about that what if if, if the, what what would you say to the children right now like children like my daughter who are stuck in this what advice yeah, I mean, would you give them? If, if if there is abuse going on like I mean it is first of all it is abuse to be kept from another parent in my opinion that is child abuse anyway absolutely but if, if there is other kinds of things going on or whatever like that there has to be there should be definitely a teacher or some adult that is quite trusting that you can actually confide in you know there is kind of lines you can call or whatever like that but obviously someone who you really know or whatever like that preferably someone who isn't that close to the person who is abusing you but you know so as i say a teacher or something like that what i used to think when i was a kid was if i tell my teacher my teacher's going to ring up, think the teacher's going to think they're going to do me a favor by ringing up my father and saying, here, listen, your kid's after saying that you did this, you know, it's probably not true, but blah, blah, blah. And then he's going to, it's going to get worse. Now, that is not what will happen. That's not what will happen. If you told in confidence, you said to a teacher or someone, it doesn't have to be a teacher, you know, someone like that, um, in authority or whatever like that, an adult basically that you trust that, you know, if you said, listen, can I talk to you in confidence? And you told them, I'm pretty sure that they would get in contact with the right people. And I'm pretty sure that if you told them, listen, just make sure that my father can't find out that I'm telling you this, whatever, they will understand. Here's that. another way to do it. Yeah. You can also go to the to an adult that you trust or that mm -hmm. you think you trust and first kind of feel it out and say, if you knew a child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be you. About Talk to their mother. What would you do, right? What would you do? And if they say, "Well, I wouldn't get involved because it's none of my business," well, then you know that 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 would yes. not be the right time. Yeah, person. that's a good point. Actually, yeah, a good way of starting is definitely a similar vein to that. Is I have a friend who might be <laughs> in this situation. Right. 
you know, and then when you get the good when you get the good reaction you can turn around and sort of say okay that friend is actually me if you keep getting bad reactions then you turn exactly. around exactly if, if okay, that person we'll go would back say and tell like, my friend, so. yeah if that person would say i would totally help that that child exactly. and i would take that child to, the, uh, to child protective services and make yeah. sure to get connected again now well, yeah. then you could say hey you know it's that it's happening to me please help me and exactly. if you tell my father i'm going to be in real real trouble i'm going to get punished and yeah. i can't have you do it that worse. yeah it gets worse it gets worse problem right. so and um, it is important that the that the adult does understand that and i think most of them will once you tell them another thing that the children can do and i'll share my screen here um so if you're a kid and you're watching this and you want to get in touch with your mom I made a how to contact your mom guide it's a tutorial on YouTube uh, on my free uh, Jasmine uh, channel here it's called the safe and secure how to contact your mom guide and it's about a 10 minute tutorial that will teach you how to make a safe email account that cannot be hacked or tracked because what a lot of the uh, abusive fathers will do is they will ins install spyware on your phone or on your computer and keep track of what you're doing on there so they're gonna see they're gonna look at all the websites that you're looking at and this little video of 10 minutes you can play it and stop it and just go in steps follow me along it'll show you how to get around all of that it'll show you how to get around your father uh, spying on you it'll show you how to make a, an email account so you can get in touch with your mom uh, of course you need to know the email address of your mom uh, in my case, um, you know, my daughter can just um, go to her website, freejasmine.com, and uh, find it there. But um, for all the other kids out there, really what you need to do um, is try to find the email address of your mom, or let's say it's your grandma that you're not allowed to see, or an uncle or an aunt, or, you know, you have a right to see the family members that you want to be in touch with. That's your basic human right, and no judge uh, can tell you that, that's, um, that you can't do that. Um, as a matter of fact, the United Nations has considered it a form of torture uh, to be kept from your parents or your grandparents or your, your, you know, your family. So I hope that helps all the kids. Um, one, one thing I would add just on your screen there is to ensure, <laughs> probably seems obvious, but ensure you're in a, like in a school internet or a library internet and not on your phone or on your home because if it is spyware and they yeah. see you going into this um, YouTube video, they're going to be on to you. <laughs> Absolutely, and so here, um, a very good point there, Brendan, uh, and it says here also, you know, um, when you install, when you go and, and create this email account um, that the tutorial is about, it also says, do not try this on your computer or cell phone, because your father might have installed spying software on there, and then he can still get your username and password and go into the email and see what you're doing. Um, you need to do this. So access this YouTube tutorial on a friend's computer or on a friend's cell phone. It's only 12 minutes. Watch it a couple of times until you totally get it. And then... Um, you know, go to that friend's house and sneak in an email and then you and your mom can connect and actually have a normal conversation because this is the other thing. All this supervised uh, visitation that's going on all over the world in these situations, they're horrible. Um, the mothers and the children are not allowed to have real conversations. These are fake, phony conversations yeah. where... They can only talk about the weather or school. You yeah. can't talk about how you feel or what you really think about it. Yeah. And it's all that control that the thought that the controlling father has yeah, is now pushed off. Then, uh, then, they, then they bring the child to home and can say whatever they want, so brainwash yeah. whatever way they want. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. It's awful. So, um, so any other things that you would want to uh, share with the children? Um, that you can think of? Um, think? No, just, I mean, as I say, just don't kind of 
don't give up. I, I wouldn't do what I did in the way, in the sense that I would, um, I would try and find that person that can help you or try and, um, as Gilda has said there, try and get on a friend's phone or computer or whatever like that and try and get contact because um, cause it's it's not something you have to endure um, and it's not something that you should be made to endure. And obviously, it's a, it's a terrible situation to be in. I mean, it's a terrible that you have to kind of do these sneaky ways to try and speak to. You know, it's empowering right. too. I mean, I, I think what's really important for children to realize is that you cannot get your childhood back and you need to yeah, fight well, for right to have ha, to, to not lose it by getting back in touch with yeah. your mother and, um, you know, screw the father. Fuck exactly. them. Sorry about my language, but what yeah. they're doing is torture and, you know, you just it need is. to find safe way to get in touch with your mom and have normal conversations and like in in our situation it was 18 years before we saw our mother from from the age of 10 to 28 and um, obviously it's great that we have our mother back in our lives and everything else but the, the one regret i always will have um is that those 18 years are lost and a lot of those are important years you know your childhood where you need your mother and your you know you know, it's it's conversations I have with my mother now are about present day things usually, you know. And and occasionally it'd be like, sure, do you remember when and oh we have to stop, you no, know, because we didn't have a relationship then, so we can't talk about that. Um so if you're if you're a child out there or whatever like that, that that's you can never mend that, you know, you can never get those years back or whatever like that. So, you know Don't wait. Don't, don't wait. wait. Oh get years. In touch with your mom and right away. You'll be okay, but 18 yeah. years, it's, 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 uh, it's something you never get back, you know. Now, when I put the announcement out for the show on Facebook and social mm -hmm. media, um, a lot of the moms contacted me. They were very excited that you were going to be on. And a bit, one of the main questions I heard from all of them was like, why did it take you so long to um, get in touch with her, to be reunited with her, and what was that like? Can you share that? Yeah, well, um, it w as I said, it was we were probably twenty three or I was about twenty three or something when um, I really f figured out that my father was kind of you know this was around the divorce case where I was like okay this guy's not a great guy um, and it takes a few years then to figure out what happens if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You've been fed so many lies over the years, whatever like that, that if, you know, one or two of the lies might seem kind of, okay, well, we can, that was a bad thing. Well, if we let him away with that and we let him away with that, you know, everybody does the odd bad thing. That's grand, whatever like that. But it's only when you actually go through um, the entire amount of it, really, that you kind of realize, well, actually what he did was as I said, alienate, you know, completely deprive us, as you say, of our mother for those years and why he did it, because he claimed to have done it for our own benefit. So you, we spent a couple of years thinking that he maybe he thought that he'd done it for our benefit, but it wasn't really for our benefit. It took a couple so you still, you, you, it takes a couple of years to process what has Absolutely. happened? And, and, and try and these, these are a couple of years as an adult, like, you yeah. know, with an adult brain. So you've had it, like, as a child, kind of trying to ignore it or trying to, you know, just get on with things, wherever. Like and then you're an adult and you're thinking, well, you know, as I say, the first thing was, okay, I don't think this guy uh, is the great guy that he's making himself out to be, you know, because um, he did make himself out to be. And, like, he was, he like, you know, as soon as we hit 18, it was like, you know, when are you going to pay me back for all the things I saved you from that horrible woman? And, all, and oh you, my lord! And, and got you this other mother who's brilliant. And look, look <laughs> at how look at how well you turned out because of what a great mother I got for you as I replaced that other old bitch. Like, so you're fed. You've been fed this for a long time, and you're kind of going, you know, when when it's put in like, look at how well you turned out. You, that's kind of a compliment, and it's like it's down to these reasons, and then you're kind right. of right. Like, they take credit for it. They take yeah, credit for it. Instead, for of, it. instead of the fact that you turned out the way you be, despite... Despite, <laughs> exactly. Despite I know, absolutely. Asshole. Despite, exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and it, it, but it's, you know, these guys are experts at, like, pointing out one thing. Like, if I could go back when he said that to me the first time, I turned around and go, and what a great 
job you did with Seamus as well. He's stuck in psychiatric care, you know, uh, you know. But of course, he'd say, well, that's none of my fault, you know, because I, I, I had this, this other mother whose child is completely derailed at age 15 on drugs and alcohol and promiscuous behavior. And um, the father is now blaming the mother yeah, for that's the derailment. I mean, it's enough. never yeah. their fault, right? No, it's never, never their fault. No. And not it's even, like, either not the even, child's fault or the mother's fault. Yeah, not even just never their fault, but they, they will tell you who it is to blame for it. Like, you know what right. I mean? Like, that's the same with Seamus. Seamus is in psychiatric care, according to my father, because he lived with her mother for 15 years. So he had a lot longer time for her to mess him up, so to speak. And he was a completely happy child up until 15. And then he went fucking, you know, because everything, <laughs> his world was turned upside down, you know. Awful. Yeah. So, let's, uh, let's, let's spin the, uh, the phone number um, on the live broadcast and take some live callers if people yeah. want to call in. <clears throat> um, I know there were uh, so many moms um, wondering what you were going to share because obviously uh, as protective mothers around the world we're wondering what this is like for our children. Um, a lot yeah. of the children when they get in touch with the mothers they, the, the children are angry. I think from what I'm taking away from your story has been really eye-opening in understanding now like okay so if you act happy or you want to hug your mother that's going to mean that you're going to there are going to be repercussions. Exactly. I get I'm starting to get it now. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I mean, like at the end of the day, like that those times when you you are a child, a ten year old child, whatever, and you are, you have a choice, you know. Okay, if I hug my mother, but particularly when it's visitations like that, it's like at the end of the day, it's the house that you're going home to sleep in, you know, it's it's the roof over you because once the door is closed, you're enclosed in that house with that person or whatever like that. So it's like even though it feels bad to not hug your mother or everything else, like you have to go home and live in that, you know, he could do anything to me, you know, that's the way you feel. So it's out of pure fear. It's fear. Like you, you go, you know, you go and you do that. I mean, it, as I say, each case is kind of different, but certainly initially it will be fear. Um, I think from speaking to a lot of mothers already on messages, um, a lot of the time it is fear, you know, uh, almost of, you know what will be done to them but this this fear there's there's also the the guilt trip one as well you know that's an old favorite of theirs as well it's like look, you know i mean a simple thing like that like you could say look i'm the one who's has a, a roof over your head i'm the one who gives you your dinner and your you know so you're upsetting me when you go and you give her a hug or you say you love her or something like that and, i and, do have to vacuum clean the house for that though <laughs> yeah i know yeah well, I do. <laughs> no no that, that wasn't for me, unfortunately. That, 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 for um, all the international children who are watching, let's talk about that for a second, because they have the hardest time. They cannot take the bus uh, back to mom or run away to mom. Um, go to the consulate. Uh, if you have double citizenship, go to the consulate uh, in the country that you're stuck in. Um, let's say, for example, my daughter, she can go to the Dutch consulate in San Francisco and uh, refuse to leave if, because, you know, she has Dutch citizenship. So as soon as she sets foot on the grounds of the Dutch consulate, she's on Dutch soil and she can say, this is what's happening. I'm 12 years old and I am refusing to leave my country, which is the Netherlands. And yeah. the United States has not taken care of me. And if they, if they say, look, we'll, we'll call Child Protective Services, you, you refuse. You say, no, Absolutely. I want to talk to Child Protective Services in the Netherlands, not yeah. the American. The Americans have not taken care of me. I live in fear and terror. I do not want this anymore, and I refuse to leave. Like Julian Assange, you know, you just get to the consulate and don't leave. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting situation, all right, but um, yeah, you're right. I mean, and that's a thing that, you know, probably, say, your daughter mightn't understand and, and, and unless you tell her. And even still, she might be kind of going, is that definite, like, definitely? What if I'm caught on the way to the consulate, like? You know, she might be worried about the repercussions. Once you get in a taxi and you're gone, I think you're gone. Like. 
I think what's important is not to be too worried about the repercussions because the repercussions yeah. can also be reasons for other adults to get involved and say, hey, you it's know. True. know it's true. It's, but it's, it's easy for us to sit here and say that. It's not as easy Absolutely. for the child who's going, yeah, but I'm the one who, as I say, behind those closed doors, stuff is happening to me that you don't well, know and this I, don't is want, why, I don't want to deal with that. That's what the kid is saying, you know. This is why it's so important to have you on because for us, you know, we can cook up a hundred scenarios in our yeah. heads of what we would do, but we don't know what it's know. like. And that's, and that's, that's, why, that's why I'm saying, like, from a child's point of view, I know that was me. I'd be sitting there and I'd be going, okay, that all sounds wonderful, but I can see a million ways how I wouldn't get from A to B without him catching me or the taxi man turning around and saying to me, Oh, listen, I think you're a bit young to be getting a taxi. I'll bring it back into your father and him yeah. going. You know what I mean? All these different scenarios that could yeah. basically obstruct this from happening and make things even worse for the kid because they have defied their father's orders and, and done the, the most horrendous crime that you can do to one of these fathers is try to see your mother. They will make you know that, you know, you could – you could go out and you could fucking murder someone and that would be grand compared to going back and trying to get in contact with your mother. That is the most heinous crime you could ever commit to these people. You know, that's the way they'll have you feel. So, or anything that kind of looks like you're doing that or whatever. So it, it will instill an amazing amount of fear in a child in that they will be thinking that all sounds brilliant on paper, but what if something goes wrong? things go horribly bad for me then. And I have to deal with the repercussions. Yeah, that's the truth. We don't know what those repercussions are. I know she, uh, she told me she used to get locked up in the closet for extended periods of time. And, yeah. Um, that kind of stuff. So we don't we don't want that. Of course, um, you know, no, just I mean, out there. I do. No. And I, what I would say even to um, anyone who was doing it as a child, I would say you still should do it like and try and be the hero and do that or whatever like that. I'm just sort of saying that I can also see the child's point of view that I'm sort of saying I can see why you would do it. And nobody yeah, blames absolutely. you if you wouldn't do it because, you know, that's another thing is like, you know, a child might worry is like, you know, you know, is my mother going to give out to me then because I didn't speak to her for two years or because I didn't, you know, and it's like, you know, the guilt and everything else, or whatever like that, you know. So well, I think Jasmine, is, if you're watching, I would never hold it against you because that, I know I that. I think you every child that, should know yeah. that, like, you know, that, um, you know, they haven't done, it's, they've done nothing wrong. It's adults that have done something wrong to them. <laughs> no. Hmm. We both knew it was coming and uh, we tried to prevent it, so... Hmm. At least she knows I tried everything, and I'm still trying everything. <laughs> I'll never stop. And I do suggest that all the children uh, try and find their moms on social media. Um, I know a lot of the fathers will block the children from um, the Facebook page from their moms, but go on another account. Go on your friend's account um, or make up another account and go look for your mom on Facebook because a lot of the protective mothers are putting out messages on their Facebook page for their children in hopes um, that they find it. Um, so please do that. And if you can just... Give a sign of life if you can send um, a Facebook message saying, hey, mom, you know, I, I'm here and I know you're out there and I'm watching and, you know, I'm reading what you're writing. Then that's, that would be wonderful because a lot of the mothers don't know if their children are still alive or where they are, yeah, what's, what's going on. happening with them, absolutely. And again, <clears throat> so, you know, it's, it's a hard thing for a child to probably do that, but it's definitely a lot easier in this day and age with technology that's out there. And kids are probably <laughs> even smarter than us at some of the technology and the ways around it. Whatever. I would say, you know, to, to a child, like, try and find that way around it and try and get in contact with that parent that you miss or whatever because, um, you know, look, it could be, you know, it could be the first contact could lead to a conversation that leads to a, a way of solving the problem as well, you know. It's certainly going well, to be easier to solve. I, if, think, I think this book, the book that you wrote... Um, should be mandatory reading material in schools and there should be discussions in schools um, 
both primary schools and um, high school, middle school and high school, as to who might be experiencing this in class, or, or maybe not even that, but maybe do a hypothetical conversation as teacher with your students as to um, that it's not okay to be held from another parent and that if you are dealing with it to get this book and then to have this book available in class in schools so children can read it and learn that this is not okay these are crimes against humanity what's happening to you is unlawful it's criminal it is considered by the United Nations a form of torture you should never put up with it you should try and find a trusted adult who can help you and be your voice and take you to Child Protective Services and make sure that you are not returned to that parent because it is absolutely cruel and you have a right to your childhood and fight for it. So that's the thing. And it, 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 when you say you talk to an adult and, and everything else, like you're fed so many times that your parents are the the two most authoritative people that you have to kind of. So there is a party as a child that kind of goes, well, if you're being subjected to that, that you sort of say, well, this is say my father. So it mustn't be a crime or it mustn't be, you know, or somehow I deserve this or, you know, sort of like, so it's definitely really important for kids to, to, to see that it's not the, it isn't that way. And just because he's your father or, you know, whatever, that doesn't mean that somebody who is a teacher or whatever, that has less authority to help you, if that kind of makes sense. It's like, don't think, well, the book stops with him kind of thing. He's in my, he's, he's in control of my care and everything else. And he's subjecting me to this. So I just have to put up with it because that's not the case um, at all. You should never have to put up with it. Um, so. Another thing you can do is just go on, go and tell everybody that you miss your mom. Yeah, absolutely. What, what can your father do about that? If you go and say that to the neighbors, to your friends, to their parents, to the teacher, to the, you know, everyone around you, I miss my mom. I miss my mom. I miss my mom. I miss my mom. If you There's can. No, if you, know, you can, if, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Again, yeah. it goes back to... You know, if I had done that when I was 10 or whatever like that, you know, I would have got the shit kicked out of me. So, you know, there's probably a lot of kids that probably won't want to do that because of that reason. I mean, if anything, if someone asked me, do you miss your mom when I was a kid, I would have turned around and said, oh, no, she's a terrible mother and she abandoned me because that's what I knew that I was told to say. And if I said anything other than that, I would be, you know, physically or some way um, punished, you know what I mean? So... Um, so, you know, but now, uh, now we know that um, if if the children are watching this, that they can say, "I am told to tell everyone that my mother abandoned me, but I don't believe it, and I miss exactly. her." Yeah, yeah. Because that really um, is the truth, and if you yeah. stay with the truth, if you truly stay with the truth, then yeah. um, it will come back to you in in good ways because people will yeah. start to understand what's going on. That's that's the thing, and as you, you speak about the truth, and I think, I mean, for everybody, um, the truth really only hurts li liars. The truth never hurts truthful people, if that makes sense. So basically, right. if, if if you are telling the truth, you cannot, you should not be hurt for telling the truth. The sh truth should not hurt you. But the reason you'd be punished for it or anything like that is because um, basically that's hurting a liar. That's the reason. That's right. So here's your website, um, hugyourmother.wordpress.com. And on the home page, if you scroll down, you can find the Amazon links to the book. Um, there's, of course, you can buy it in Europe and UK and USA. There are different Amazon links. Please buy this book. If you're a teacher and you're watching this, please buy it in bulk and start distributing this in schools, in uh, extracurricular activity uh, locations, as well as courthouses. I am going to suggest we buy this book by the thousands and start sending it to attorneys, to judges, to evaluators, to 
we need to massively protest uh, about the fact that judicial child trafficking is happening and that we are absolutely here to change that once and for all. Brenna, I'm so happy that you came on the show today and shared yeah, your story. Totally. Thanks for having you me on. Truly one of the most important interviews I've done, and I've done about almost 40 of them. The child's perspective to me is the most important. Uh, I'm, I'm, of course, a, a protective mother in, in um, on the other end of it, but what you're going through is what's going through my mind all the time. Like, what is this like for Jasmine? And I think a lot of the viewers um, will be enormously helped because for example mothers will come to me and say my child is so angry at me we now have the answer we now understand why they're angry what that is about that is about how and, they've and, been and that will pass you know <laughs> once the child figures everything out that will pass and i mean you can yes. help the child to figure that out um don't force it on them but you can help them you just with facts which the truth again you know what i mean um, yeah. A good way of kind of doing things that what we found when we when we were writing the memoir where we ended up kind of figuring everything out was um, putting everything in chronological order, you know, because everything kind of sort of starts to make sense um, when you know what happened from the start to the end, you know, and each event happens in between or whatever like that. So if you have a child that's kind of angry or whatever like that at you or whatever like that, if you can try and put out the facts to them in chronological order and, 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 and just tell the story again, like as I say with a memoir we wrote, we didn't say here's an episode that happened and the reason this happened is because our father's an asshole. We let the reader make up their minds on who's the bad guy and who's the good guy. We just tell what happens. And, and that's what, what you need what to I, do. What I think we need to do um, to finish it off because we have yeah. a few seconds. <clears throat> Your mic. <laughs> Seconds left. And yeah. Okay. No problem. Yeah. What I, what I wanted to uh, end with is that I suggest um, that you and I keep brainstorming on how yeah. to to get support groups out there for children who are still in hostage situations that so they can communicate in safe ways so we can help them get out and to create more of these support systems for adult survivors of maternal deprivation and to um, go into schools together and explain what this is like, um, mm -hmm. to go to World Congress in Dublin next year, and in June, um, year, yeah. about family law. I've been invited to go there um, okay. to represent protective yeah. mothers, so we, we could meet there and, um, you know, yeah. hand out flyers to people, stuff like that. You know, there's lots we can do. Yeah. Um, I think we should band together and, and, and be a force. Uh, mothers and children against abusive fathers, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and the no, judicial I mean. system that supports them because yeah. this must end this torture that you have gone through. And, and JP, I am so sorry for the both of you. I wish I could do something and wave my magic wands to fix it for you. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, there, there, there's no fixing now or whatever, but it's all in the past. And as far as myself and JP are concerned, it, it stays in the past. And what we want to do now is use the kind of the, the bad experience that we've had to try and have some positive change for the future. Okay. But it doesn't happen to, to doesn't have to happen to other kids. Um, I, I just wish I could make it different for you because it's an awful story. But what you've done is make lemonade out of lemons. And yeah. you're here just in this interview with me to, uh, you've helped a lot of people I know. So you've helped me today. Yeah, so, cool. yeah. Thank um, you I, so much. I no really problem, uh, super um, appreciate I, it. I do get um, messages and stuff like that from others and, and asking for advice or whatever like that. And I'm absolutely fine with that on Facebook or on Gmail or whatever. But if I don't answer straight away, I'm not ignoring you. I will answer after. It Thank just, you. Actually so many. I know it gets overwhelming. There's yeah. so many. There's thousands of us. So. It's, it's, unfortunately, there's so many. That's, yeah. that's the problem. Um, yeah. So there you go. Thank you so much. Okay, um, no problem. Maybe in the future we'll have you on again if you want. Um, yeah, sure. I'd greatly appreciate it. We can do um, a okay. show with people calling in because um, we were yeah, we'll get Yeah, we'll get it together. I feel like we could have sat here and chatted all night, to be honest, anyway. So. You know what? You could even start your own program on CCN. <laughs> 
experience. You'll see. You'll see. <laughs> All right. Thank All right. you, Brandon. Thanks a million, Geert. Please thank you, your brother for me. I will, of course. Well. Yeah, yeah, no, okay. I will, of course. Definitely. And and please give your mom a hug for me. I will, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we need the All website. Right. Hug your mother. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And um, this was another episode of Hells for Children. And I hope you join me again next week. Bye, everybody. If we want to change the world, we must first change the media. Mainstream media exists for the purposes of indoctrination and manipulation of public.